Good morning, everyone. We gather here to enter the presence of our Lord and offer him praise. Come and worship. All you all who, who love, love and serve, serve our God, God, who surrounds us with unfailing love and answers us when, when we call. call, who cares for the humble and lowly and, and never, never abandons, abandons those in need. need. This is our God, worthy of our worship and, and praise. praise. Let us all stand and let us worship Jesus in total surrender. Worship him with all our heart.
go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the only one worthy of all the praise we can offer, despite how little it is compared to what you deserve. Your sacrifice on the cross and resurrection out of your great love for us compels us to worship. You are holy. You are omnipotent. You are eternal. Your power is perfected in our weakness through your Holy Spirit in each of us. Never us, Lord, but always through Jesus Christ in us. In your powerful name we pray. Amen.
is our joy, our righteousness, and our freedom, our steadfast love, our deep and boundless peace. Let's pass the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ. Let's all be seated. We all depend on our Lord God for strength, sustenance, and salvation, bringing Him glory through the workings of the Holy Spirit in us. You asked for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave, I gave them, them for a, for a moment, moment, but then withdrew, withdrew them for the, for the work, work was hard. hard. You asked for my life that you might work through me. I gave, I gave a, a small part, part that, that I, I might, might not get, get too involved. involved. Lord, forgive us our calculated, calculated efforts to serve you only when it is convenient for us to do so. so. Only, only in, in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive us, renew us, send us out as a usable instrument that we might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. Let's now take this time for personal silent prayer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Words of grace from Psalm 121, verses 7 to 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord, the Lord will, will keep, keep your going out and your coming in from, from this time forth and forevermore. and forevermore. What a comfort it is to know that the Lord will guard our steps from this time and forevermore. Let us behold the grace of God as we listen to the choir.
Kids can now go upstairs to the Sunday school classes and we'll just go through a couple of announcements. So this coming May 28th, uh, the following Sunday, let us pray together for our congregational prayer and that will be happening at 1.30 p.m. right after our monthly lunch. So let us all come together in prayer as one community next Sunday. And our drop-in volleyball at RCS Elementary is on May 27th, Saturday. Uh, still the same time from 1 to 3 as our sports ministry is always, and the cost is $7. Same registration link uh, if you would like to join. And take a moment to consider the gifts God has given to you talents and abilities, opportunities you've received, and ask God to help you enjoy them and to reveal to you the ways they can bring Him glory. We are looking for people to serve in many areas of the English ministry as we continue to grow and deepen our faith together. So please take the time to scan the QR codes on the posters that you will be seeing, and also you can visit icrc.ca slash volunteers dash opportunities to find out more where you can join and serve. God has also given us material gifts, not only talents and abilities, through financial provision. And we can use these as well to bring Him glory. Our tithing through e-transfer and drop-off in church is our worship through giving. And let us now lift up our prayer of thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, we give you, we give with joy into your kingdom today. May you bless our offering. Come, O oh Lord, and work through these gifts. Extend your love through us, we pray. Amen. Isabel will now be reading our scripture from Genesis 20 this morning. Good afternoon. Our scripture reading for today is from Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 to 7, and I'm reading from the ESV. From there, Abraham journeyed towards the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerah. And Abraham said of Sarah is his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, 
You are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know about you, but every time the choir sings, I feel like I'm transported somewhere else. I feel like I'm in heaven, you know, where the voices are in tune, where the direction of the worship is uniform and, co- and concerted. Oh, how I, wish, how I wish that this would be our experience of worship every day, uh, especially in the church. Now, today's message is taken from Genesis 20. And we've been studying through uh, the first couple of chapters of Genesis, how God is turning the world upside down. He's preparing a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that God, who are going to be God's possession, a people who will declare His praises because He has called them out of darkness into His marvellous light. He's preparing a people. But what happens if God's people mess up? If God's people join the upside down, what happens? Today we're going to study Genesis chapter 20, and we're going to look at Abraham's folly, his foolishness. But before we go in, into the passage, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time where we can sit under the authority of your word. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you this day that together we might look at your word afresh and anew and see what you have for us, how we should perceive and how we should act in light of your grace. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in the first two verses, we have Abraham journeying into the Negev. The Negev is in the south of Israel. It's a dry, dusty, arid region. Uh, and he sojourned in Gerar, right? So Abraham and Sarah, they live a nomadic lifestyle. They have been given the promise of the land of Canaan that is to be uh, theirs for their descendants, but they themselves have no place to call their own. So they sojourn. They are unable to settle. They move from place to place. Sometimes the places that they choose to settle in are uninhabited. No one's there. And then sometimes the places that they choose are inhabited with an established population, with their own forms of government. In those times, a king. So Abraham and Sarah go south, and he tells Abimelech, the king of Gerar, that Sarah is his sister. And things quickly go south from there. I mean, he's already in the south, but things quickly go south from here. Does this sound familiar? I don't know if, if, if we were going through Genesis 12, I didn't spend too much time in the second half of Genesis 12. But there's an account almost exactly like this one. Abraham and Sarah, they journey south, not to Gerar, but to Egypt. Abraham tells the Pharaoh, this is my sister. A catastrophe almost happens. But God intervenes. And that catastrophe is averted. Some of you might have this sense of deja vu. Uh, especially if you attended EF on Thursday where Jet taught us all about deja vu. Uh, this has happened before. So if you go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 11 and 13, you'll see. He expects, Abraham expects, you see, some level of brokenness when he's in Egypt. He is, he's expecting some kind of murder, kidnap sexual violence. And so he's expecting this because his wife 
you know, uh, is beautiful and even in her old age, he's worried that maybe the Pharaoh would do something there. And so this, this perception of how Egypt is in chapter 12 leads to a certain kind of action. What he sees will affect how he acts, right? Now, this is not uncommon. If you've been following us, with us through the series of Genesis, you'll see that post-fall, after Genesis chapter 3, there is a regular... Um, it, it is very common to see fallenness, right? Entire societies, whole groups of people. There will be those who will oppose the way of the serpent, but there will be those who give in uh, to, to the serpent and to follow uh, deceptive ways. This is not uncommon. Entire peoples and nations experience moral decay. So, for example, we, we just did uh, Genesis chapter 19 last week, and we saw how an entire society at Sodom had actually gone astray. So Abraham has to make a decision about how to deal with this. So he says, say you are my sister. Now, if Abraham is presented as Sarah's husband, he fears that the Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt, would seek to possess Sarah by force and would kill Abraham. But if he's presented as her brother, then maybe his life could be spared. So to avoid a disastrous outcome, his death, he tells a half-truth. Now, in our text for today, Abraham explains a little more. He says that they share the same father but not the same mother. I know it's a little disturbing, especially in today's terms. But I want, I want to point out something for us. If you've, been, if you've been tracking with us through the book of Genesis, every time that we hear this said in Genesis, it's in quotation marks. So it's something that Abraham says, something that he tells his wife to say, so something that Sarah says. And in one case, it's Abimelech himself later on speaking. So some could say that this, would, this is solely Abraham's fiction, this is something that he says to prevent himself from getting killed. All right, Genesis 11. Uh, so, so the author of Genesis doesn't actually write those words. Whenever those words come up in Genesis, it's in the mouths of Abraham, Sarah, or Abimelech. In Genesis 11, Moses, the author, describes Sarai as Abraham's wife and Terah's daughter-in-law. Okay, Terah is the father of Abraham. Terah's daughter-in-law. But because not much more is said about this matter, we can surely say that Abraham is somewhere between telling half a truth, which means he's half lying, or totally telling an untruth, fully lying. He's somewhere in between. I'm glad, though, that the Bible doesn't airbrush its heroes of faith. Now, Abraham is going to be a hero of faith. If you turn all the way to Hebrews chapter 11, his name will feature significantly in the account of God's, um, of those people who, who have faith in God. But the Bible does not airbrush its heroes. That gives us actually some hope. Someone who believed in God was also like this. Ah, I don't have to be perfect. Now, it's not that we strive to replicate the fallenness here and the brokenness here, all right? But this is good news for those of us who are engaging with our own brokennesses, our own sins, our own fallenness, that perhaps there is space for us too that we might engage in faith with God. Genesis 20, verses, 30 to four, uh, verses 3 to 4, God comes to Abimelech in a dream by night. But God, this is a divine interruption. But God, the story is going one way. It's going a bad way. It's going towards human brokenness and sin. And if without God's intervention, it's going to turn out terribly. Wicked problems, problems where there's simply no good solution, where sometimes the solution contributes to the problem or creates a whole different set of problems. These are wicked problems. And, and Abraham is caught in the midst of a wicked problem. But thanks be to God, He's going to interrupt humanity's downward drift. He will put a stop to the problem of sin. The serpent from Genesis 3 will try his best to multiply brokenness and to encourage humanity to slide into brokenness. 
but God. Do you see that? Do you see the divine intervention? The world is headed down the tubes, but God, but God's grace, He stops it. My life was headed down the tubes, but God. Those of us who believe in God, our lives were headed for a poor destination, a bad destination, but God. Thank God for interruptions that are divine. But God. God comes to Abraham, uh, to Abimelech in a dream and declares him a dead man. He reveals that Sarah is someone else's wife. Abimelech had not approached, had not come near her, had not done anything wrong. And so God actually arrests Abimelech before he does something wrong. Contrast this to the passage we read last week, Genesis 19 where for Sodom, for the city of Sodom, their need to gratify their own desires was so strong that immediately when they found out that two visitors had come into town, they wanted to bang the, the door down on Lot's house, right? Contrast that. The immediacy, the need to give in to their own desires, as opposed to Abimelech, who had not yet approached, had not yet come near. I want to say this. In this story, things are also a little bit askew. Abraham is the one who received the revelation from God. Abraham is also the one who received the promises of God. But it seems like Abimelech is behaving like the one who knows God. Oh, something is a little bit askew here. But don't be surprised. God can reveal Himself to people that we think will never, ever believe. Okay? Have you ever thought of a person in your minds or, you know, at work or something and you thought to yourself, this person, hi, this person will never believe. Let me challenge you there. Don't say never. God can reveal Himself to the hardest of hearts and can break through. Darren Carlson tells a story of a Persian migrant who goes to a refugee centre at 6 a.m. in the morning. He's really agitated. And he tells this story to a Persian pastor. He says, during the night, someone dressed in white said, stand up and follow me. And the Persian man said, who are you? And the man in white said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the way to heaven. No one can go to the Father except through me. He asked, who is he, this, this, this Persian guy? Who is this guy? What am I going to do? How am I going to follow this guy? Where shall I go? Tell me. Tell me. Show me the way. And pastor takes out a Bible. This is a true story, okay? Pastor takes out a Bible. He, he asked the, the guy, do, do you know what this is? He says, I don't know. I've never seen this. This is a Bible. The pastor opens to the book of Revelation and says, I am, where it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. He receives this in a dream. This man starts to cry and he says, how can I accept him? How can I follow him? So the pastor leads him in prayer. And peace came over him. The pastor gives him a Bible and he tells, the pastor tells this guy, hide it. The Muslims, your fellow Muslims in the camp are not going to like it when you take the Bible. Hide it. <laughs> you know what he says? He says, the Jesus that I met today, the Jesus that I met today, he's more powerful than the Muslims in the camp. <laughs> he goes out and an hour later, he comes back with 10 more persons and he tells the pastor, these guys want the Bible. <laughs> oh my gosh. But God, God can intervene. God can reveal. And my heart's prayer for you all tonight or today is that you will experience divine interruption, all of you. Now, it might not be pleasant or fun, okay? I mean, in the case of Abimelech, this was a warning. You, if you don't turn from your ways, you're going to be a dead man. It's a warning, it's not pleasant, it's not fun, but it's almost absolutely necessary. You see, our brokenness is like a cancer that without treatment will continue to ravage us from the inside out. It, it, it's, like, it's, it's something that's not good for you, but something that the body thinks of as its own. It's tricking the body, it's deceiving the body to think that this is part of yourself, but it has to be removed. And God, in, 
intervene, in intervening like this, whenever you see but God, when God intervenes, He's like a skillful surgeon who determines exactly how much needs to get cut out, how much needs to be removed, the extent of the cancer to remove it. No, it's like taking something out of you. It will be painful, it will be unpleasant to say the least. But you know what? Left untreated, if it's still in your body, it'll also kill you. It'll destroy you from the inside out. My prayer is that each of you will experience divine interruption. Abimelech experiences this divine interruption. And interestingly enough, his response is, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Oh, we talked about intercession, prayer for others. Last week, shall not the judge of the whole earth do what is right? Lord, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? That was what we heard last week, right? These were prayers, intercession on behalf of a people. And Abimelech steps into the position of intercess, intercession. Will you kill an innocent people? Some deja vu as well here. Abimelech rem remonstrates with God with a question. Will you kill an innocent people? So here, Abimelech is the intercessor. And Abraham is the immoral. The one who has told at least a half-truth. Now we move on to verses 5 and 6. Remember, remember that Sarah has received the promise of a son who will be born to her. Alright? Whereas in Genesis chapter 12, the promise was a general son, uh, you know, a, a son in general. That means the, 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 the line was not specified. Once we go through Genesis 16, 17 and 18, especially at Genesis 18, it becomes very clear. Sarah is to have a son and the divine visitors told her within a year. This sojourn to Gerar could have resulted in a son being born to Sarah, but not from Abraham. The stakes are really high. You know, on the one hand, God's covenant with Abraham that through Sarah, there will be a line, a, a group of a, a descendants who will be blessed, who will be blessed to be a blessing, who will be a blessing to the nations. On the one hand, there is that promise of that covenant. And yet, here at Gerar, there's a huge threat to that promise. But God, but God intervenes. God says, I know you have done this in the integrity of your heart. It was I who kept you from sinning against me. God appears to Abimelech, warns him ahead of time, and prevents him from interfering with the covenant promise that he makes with Abraham. All right? Don't do this. This is not going to, be, this is not going to work out well for you. Don't do this. God steers him away. That's divine intervention. But God. So even in the midst of Abraham's folly, even as he is not d demonstrating the trust in God, the kind of faith in God that we, we hope to see from a person who, who, of whom it said in Genesis 15, he believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We were hoping to see that, that kind of trust from, from Abraham. But yet, in the midst of his folly, in the midst of his faithlessness, in the midst of his unfaithfulness, guess what? God remains faithful. God remains faithful. How good it would have been if Abraham was the one who was interceding with God for his family. How good it would have been if before making major decisions, he would be praying about them and bringing them before God. God, I have to go this direction. But would you be with me? Would you cover over me? Would you protect me? Would you help me so that I don't have to lie? Would you help me so that I don't have to say untruths? I believe in you. How good it would have been if Abraham had done that, trusting God for everything in the midst of his travel. How great if it would be that Abraham that walks with integrity of heart and innocence of hands. 
But God intervenes. Verses 9 and 10. Abimelech then confronts Abraham. You almost got me killed. You almost brought a curse on the entire nation. You know, so, so this, this, this person who, we, we've never actually seen him, you know, uh, when we're studying uh, the book of Genesis. This is the first time that we meet with Abimelech. And yet this is the one uh, where after one revelation, by now, Abraham has received multiple revelations from God. This is the one person who's received just one uh, revelation from God. And he goes and he confronts Abraham. But pay attention to what he says, the question that he asks. These questions, we've, we've been studying actually yesterday. Uh, there was a mentoring, uh, a mentoring, marriage mentoring session where we studied a little bit about how to ask good questions. And this, this is a really good question. It says, what did you see that you did this thing? What did you see that you did this thing? Abimelech is a leader. He's had years of experience as a leader. So he knows that when people act, it's not simply out of nothing, so to speak. There is a view. There is a perspective that's at work. There is a worldview that is shaping a person. So the actions that you perceive or the actions that you experience, those are the outflow of something that has already happened on the inside, a view or a worldview. So he asks, he doesn't just ask, why did you do this, this thing that you did? He asks, what did you see? What was your perspective? Now, some of us are going to be in leadership positions, whether titled or untitled. So if in a family, you're the head of a household or your parents, well, you have uh, some leadership there. If you're at work, sometimes, you know, you might have to lead a project or lead a team. There's some leadership over there. In, in, the, in, our, in, in church, if you're working in a ministry, sometimes you have to take the lead in certain things. Leadership requires the ability, the insight to be able to ask some questions like this because perception precedes action. The depth of your perception, how deep, how deeply you see will affect the dimensions of your action. How deeply you see will affect how you do things. What did you see? that you did this thing. I want, to bring up, I want to jog our memory a little bit to Genesis 16 where we read about the story of Hagar, right? And, and, and as she experiences God in the desert, she declares of Him, You are el Roi. You are the God who sees me. The God who calls me by name. Everyone else calls me servant by the title, my job title, by my function, slave. Everyone else calls me, not by my name, but you are the God who sees. And not only that, but you provide. So God not only sees, but God sees too. God doesn't just look at her, God looks after her, right? And what is Hagar's response when she perceives that it is God who sees her, recognizes her, knows her, protects her? Her response is twofold. Worship on the one hand, she begins to worship God and obedience. She listened to God's word, asking her to go back to what was an impossible situation, immense strife with Sarah. Not, not, not Sarah here, but the biblical Sarah. Um, immense strife would have been almost an impossible situation. But she responds, because she perceives that God is at work, then whatever He asks her to do must therefore be okay, must be good for her. So she responds in worship and obedience. What did you see that you did this thing? What did Abraham see? Well, in verse 11, he says, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God in this place at all, and they will kill me because of my wife. He perceives that there's no fear of God, neither in Gerar nor in Egypt. In Genesis 20, Abraham doesn't see the grace of God going ahead of him, surrounding him, guarding him. He does not see the covenant promises 
that he would have a son, descendants beyond measure. They would be blessed to be a blessing, that they would bless nations. He doesn't see all of this. So he did this thing. He modified the truth. You know, he told a half-truth. I did this because I thought there's no fear of God in this place. Well, the, the question is not simply about sight then. The question is about insight. Since they don't know God, I will have to do something to preserve my own life. The irony is that his own perception of Gerar becomes his own lived reality. He becomes the one who does not know the fear of God in this whole account. The way that he sees Gerar, the way that he sees the people of Gerar, is affecting the way that he's behaving himself. These are people who are likely to engage in murder, kidnap, violence. Well, if I lie, it's not so bad. It's okay. He acts as if he does not see or know God. He acts as if he does not fear God. In fact, in this chapter, it's a little bit uncomfortable because Abimelech seems to be the one who sees God. He seems to be one who has faith in God. Fear God more than Abraham. How often have we acted like the people whom we see? People who are in our lives, people who are around us, people who, with whom we may think we have no shared value systems. Just as Abraham did not really have a shared value system with Abimelech, how often have we behaved like the people that are around us? I just want to encourage us. We need to live in a slightly different direction. If, if there's anything that we take out of Genesis 20, is that we are not to live like the cultures, the culture or the cultures that surround us. We're not to live like that. We're called to a different path. What did you see that you did? This thing. And although I don't have it up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, uh, either uh, digital copies or, or, or hard copies, feel free to look at verses 14 to 16, because um, in the same chapter, Genesis 20, because there Abimelech takes sheep and oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. He says, Behold, my land is be before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And he gives Abraham a thousand pieces of silver. So this is reparation, restoration, right? Um, he kind of does what is right, makes right with Abraham and Sarah. Then Abraham, in verse 17, then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. Here at the end, finally, Abraham does one thing that is right. After a series of mistakes, he prays to God, and God responds. He heals Abimelech. Now, we're not sure what illness befell. Abimelech is not said uh, in the text for us, uh, but he, God heals Abimelech and all the women in Gerah. Uh, for, a mo for a period of time, they were not able to conceive. God responds. God responds to Abraham's prayer. Abraham's deception here in Genesis 20, as well as before in Genesis 12, almost leads to a curse being placed on nations, Egypt and Gerar. This is the direct opposite of God's plan for Abraham, right? Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. He was blessed to be a blessing. In him, all the nations of the earth were to be blessed. All the families of the earth were to be blessed. But finally, finally, God intervenes. If not for God's intervention, instead of being a blessing, He would have become a curse. Instead of being different than um, the people of the surrounding nations, He would have been like the people of the surrounding nations. Instead of participating in God's plan to turn the world upside down so that it might be right side up, Abraham would have been participating in the upside down. But finally, God intervenes. And after Abimelech confronts him, he finally sees. He sees God's work in Abimelech's life. He sees that even though he assumed that Abimelech did not fear God, God could continue.
to work sovereignly, wonderfully, beautifully in Abimelech's life. He sees that what he has done was wrong and the depth of his perception is restored. The dimension of his action follows. He does what is right. He prays. Finally turns to God. He intercedes for Abimelech and and the nation and God responds to that prayer. I want us to pause for a minute. In our own lives, your own lives, can I ask you a question? What did you see? It's a very abstract question. I know it's a very difficult question. Asking someone, what do you see that God is saying to you in this time? How are you perceiving God in this time? It's an abstract question. But I think it's important to pay attention to, nevertheless. Because if we don't see God in our picture, in the, in the picture of our own lives, we're going to live like people who don't have God in our, our lives. Our perception will affect our actions, right? In your life, in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. Parker Palmer says that contemplation is any way a person has of penetrating illusion and touching reality. Getting through the illusion, arriving at reality. And in this frenziedly busy world, where machines work 24 by 7, where the internet connects us all the time, where our minds are already moving to the next thing while our hands are engaging with the work that's currently before us. Do you have time in your day to see? To actually see? Do you have time in your day to contemplate about what God is doing in your life? To stop for a bit? To push past illusion? To perceive reality? Do you have time in your day for reflection? Introspection? I ask this because if the, percep- if the depth of your perception affects the dimensions of your action, then what does the lack of perception do to you, to us? What does that do? It, it reduces us to actions without insight. That's the very definition of machines, those things that work 24 by 7. Action without insight. We're reduced to automatons. Things, not people. Moving from action to action without pausing to think why we're doing what we're doing. My encouragement to you this week is it would be good if you could mark out some time for reflection. If you don't have a habit for a daily reflection, start with once a week. It's okay. Start once a week. Circle out time. Set that aside. Now, I, I know this, okay, because I, I'm not speaking to you as like some p- pastor who, you know, this is my first year As a pastor and as a worker, no, I have worked 14 years before this. I know what it's like. When I was a project manager for for, um, a a large project, you know, my days were so packed that from 12 to 12.30, I had to put in my calendar lunch so that I could eat. Because before I did that, there were days I went without lunch and by the time I know it, it's like 6 or 7 in the evening and I'm absolutely hungry. My stomach hurts, Right? So I know this, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this out of nowhere, okay? But I don't want us to become like automatons, like things, like machines, computers. We're not. That's not who we are. We're made in the image of God. Thanks be to God. We're made in the image of God. And contemplation is that one practice that's going to get us past illusion towards reality. Mark out some time and begin your reflection time with a prayer. You could say something like, Lord, help me see. El Roi, you are the God who sees me. You are the God who will see to all of my circumstances. Help me see. Uh, one, of my, one of the pastors that I listen to a lot, Pastor Edmund Chan, he has this in his own quiet time. He will take something that represents something important to him and he'll pray over it. So sometimes he takes out his glasses. And for him, insight is very important, right? So he says, God, Take, he, he takes his glasses in the morning and he will pray, God, help me see. Help me see the way you want me to see. Right? If you find that that's useful, in, integrate that into your, your reflection time. 
And then after you've said that prayer, you know, maybe read and reflect on a portion of Scripture. If that day you've decided to set aside 15 minutes, then I would say 7 to 10 verses, a, 10 to a passage that's 7 to 10 verses, not too much more. If you've set, up, if you've set aside 30 minutes, then you could probably do a chapter. All right? But whatever it is, I encourage you to start. Start where you're at. Some of us are in the midst of divine interruption, a but God moment. Okay, it doesn't happen all the time, thankfully. Um, we're not always confronted and challenged and, and, and kind of um, being shown what we're like. But if you're in the midst of a divine interruption, I have some thoughts for you as well. You can start your reflection time with Lord help me see. Lord help me see. In this time of disorientation, maybe it's doctor's visits, maybe it's fraying relationships, maybe it's personal setbacks, things that are happening at home. During this time of disorientation, Lord, help me see. I don't want to see as the world sees. The world is probably just going to see this as things that need to be solved, issues that need to be, uh, you know, either medically resolved or uh, somehow socially resolved. I don't want to see as the world sees. I don't want to act as the one who does not know God. Lord, would you help me see how you see in my time of disorientation? Perhaps you're telling me something about myself. Perhaps you're telling me something that needs to, to be changed to get right. Are there things in my life that are hindering your work? Are there parts of me hidden, unknown to myself, that are growing, causing me to pursue life in a way that's contrary to your design? Lord, in this time of disorientation, help me see. I want to end today's sermon. I don't usually do this, but I want to end with today's sermon with a preview of next week's passage. Is that okay? The Lord visited Sarah as He had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as He promised and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Wow. The Lord visited Sarah as He had said. The Lord did to Sarah as He had promised. Do you hear me? Do you hear the words of Scripture? In the midst of Abraham's folly, God's continuing to be faithful. In the midst of Abraham's faithlessness and unfaithfulness, God's going to continue to be faithful. He's turning the world upside down. The world is mired in brokenness. And it's upside down, it doesn't even know. And God is turning that whole world around so that even in spite of all the twists and turns, in spite of His faithlessness, God was faithful. Just as He said. Just as He promised. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up on stage and lead us in a time of worship. I invite you all to stand. We're going to sing the song, Goodness of God. And I want us to think about the goodness of the faithfulness of God. Let's, let's worship together. Your mercy never fails me In all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God You have been faithful All my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God I love your voice I love your voice 
have led me through the fire in darkest nights in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god all my life breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you is running after it's running after me all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am me goodness of God. Oh, I, I will, will sing of the goodness of God. I invite you to raise your arms in a posture of reception as I speak the benediction over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up His countenance on you and give you peace that you might perceive God's faithfulness in your own lives and participate alongside Him as He acts to save this world. Blessings are pronounced this day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated and we invite you to join us in a moment of contemplation before we go from here.